Good morning and welcome back to 7 Minutes of Sport. Now, for all of you who have kept with us so far, this is actually a very big episode because we are recording today in our brand new podcast room, which is kitted out with all of these fancy microphones. And being completely truthful, I panicked at first when I saw them, but actually it is quite good fun talking into them. And I actually have no idea whether this equipment properly works or not. So I guess we'll find out at the end of the episode. So everyone keep your fingers crossed or else I'm about to waste seven minutes of my guest's time. And on that note, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by a senior associate in the sports group of Bird and Bird and co-head of their women's sports practice. Now, this guest acts primarily for national and international sports governing bodies, federations and sporting organisations across a range of sports and is also a board member of England Corfball, which I actually think might be one of my favourite facts I have said about a guest on this podcast. Now, if I'm right, her passion for sport comes from her background in tennis, where she competed as a junior at the international level. And I also understand she is a passionate diversity and inclusion advocate who chairs the Bird and Bird Social Mobility Network Beyond Background. So with all of that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Larissa Easterbrook. So Larissa, hello and welcome to the podcast. Hello and thank you for having me. I have to say that makes me sound a lot more impressive than I actually am. So far too it. modest, <laughs> far too modest. <laughs> now we're going to be discussing today health barriers for girls and women in sport. And just so the listeners know, Larissa actually co-wrote a very interesting article on this this year. I think it was in March, is that right? That's about right. Uh, and we're going to discuss some of what was written in that article, but I'll let you know where you can find it after we finish so that you can go and have a read. So I have a timer here to start and you can see the very high tech that is my mobile phone. Uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Fabulous. So we are here to talk about the barriers that girls and women face in sports. And this was addressed in a report published by the Women and Equalities Committee on the 5th of March of 2024. So do we know how or where the committee collected the information to draft the report? Yeah, so the committee first started gathering oral evidence in late 2022 and early 2023 on girls and women's experiences of sexism and inequality in football. And then after that, they decided to turn their attention to female health related needs in sport more widely so then they gathered a further round of oral evidence from june to november last year in 2023 and they collected it from a wide range of sources so current and recently retired former athletes across cycling netball rowing rugby um women's sports organizations like women in sport the well hq i think as well um, a GP specialising in menopause, representatives from sports governing bodies and UK Sports, Sports England as well. So a very wide range. Now, the report starts by addressing girls' participation in sport at an early age and addresses that dropout rates during puberty. Is there anything in particular that the report says could help support young girls in sport? Yeah, so the report talks about a number of reasons why girls might, why they might see a drop in girls' participation in sport, going through puberty, growing boobs, beginning periods, things like that. The kit they're asked to wear, P not being, or sport not being seen as cool or feminine, parental encouragement. And I know if I think that's my own experience, those, it, if I was, I was obsessed with sport and had lots of parental encouragement, but I know lots of the other girls, you know, absolutely hated PE, refused to get change in kit. They'd try and skive off altogether. So it, it, it is, is definitely an issue. So in terms of what the report said, one of their recommendations was that PE kit guidance should be reviewed to ensure that all schools permit the widest possible choice for girls. And that seemed to be on the basis that some data showed that simple steps like expanding the flexibility of the kit can increase comfort and thereby increase participation. Um, better education was another thing as well. So on the benefits of sports bras and also on the menstrual cycle, making sure there was education there from an earlier age. So the report then goes from the younger age into addressing women during midlife. What are some of the key barriers to women in midlife? Yeah, so they identified a few, um, many of which won't come as a surprise, I'm sure. So women in midlife, the report found, tend to be very time poor. Um, women in sport, the charity mentioned to the committee in their evidence that a lot of women at that stage of life have less than 35 minutes 
a day of time to themselves by the time that they've been to work, often when they're at the peak of their careers, and after they've also looked after everybody else, whether children or relatives. So, Blimey. you know, if, if that's all they have, then, you know, how are they going to meet the minimum recommended exercise time? Um, the report also identified things like perimenopausal, menopausal symptoms as well to contend with, or particularly women who've given childbirth, they might have weaker pelvic floors preventing them or making it more difficult to participate in exercise. And they also mentioned that some of the barriers to participation from early on in life, they might not be overcome by, by older women as well. So, for example, the idea that P wasn't feminine or ladylike, that might yeah. be something they're still carrying with them. And so they have to get over that as well as all, all the other hurdles as well. A part of the report I actually found really interesting related to needing better research on the physiology of women. Can you just explain what the findings were on that point, in particular with relation to sports kit, which you've mentioned already briefly? Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's quite frustrating, I think, on the research. (laughs) Interesting, but frustrating. So uh, a recent academic article, which I think is noted in the report, was that only 6% of sports science and exercise research studies were conducted by women using all female participants. So clearly a lot of room for improvement. Um, The report also found that female footballers are between three and six times more likely to suffer an ACL knee injury than their male counterparts. Um, And the report was quite damning about that. They said that they've got no doubt that if a health issue of similar magnitude affected elite male footballers, then it would have received a faster, more thorough and better coordinated response. Um, And just on the kit thing, so there was a lot of criticism around female football boots. And, well, or more specifically, the lack of them, the report yeah. said that that was symptomatic of gender inequality and sexism in sport, that the first women's football boot came to the market less than four years ago and that only limited progress had been made since then with those few boots that are now available only being available at a very high price point and therefore not necessarily being accessible to to many women. Um, and it, the, the football boots was also referenced as one of a number but a potential factor in higher rates of ACL injuries in female footballers as well you know what interesting but so frustrating yeah (laughs) yeah turning now to pregnancy can you describe the experience that some of the sports women came forward and discussed with the barriers the pregnancy can have in particular when returning to the sport from maternity leave Yeah, so they gathered evidence from a number of athletes or former athletes. Um, So three referenced in the report. One was professional footballer Fern Whelan, who said in giving evidence to the committee, she said many women still had poor experiences depending on which football club they played for, with some clubs having a culture that prevented players from even wanting to talk about having a baby. Um, And I guess with football clubs, a lot of that, the difference in support will depend on resource um, because there's a huge gulf between women's football clubs at the top of the WSL compared to the bottom or obviously championship clubs as well. Um, There was a former England netball player they spoke to, Ebony Yuzuro Brown. She said that the support she'd received from England netball was pioneering and thought that it could be a model of best practice or good practice for other sports. She said that they'd ensured she had a pelvic floor health consultant, both prenatally and postnatally. She was invited to come along to training sessions the whole way through to provide input. There was no expectation on her return to the sport. Um, And then they spoke to Aurora as well, who had a more mixed experience. So she said that support during pregnancy had been brilliant, but that she was very frustrated about the support that she got on her return to top level competition. So um, talking about when she was removed from the main program straight away, um, rather than being able to give the opportunity to, you know, take the time to to get back to the the right level and she said not all of her coaches have been supportive as well and that that made a really big difference so um a range of experiences but clearly lots lots more to be done absolutely and that does lead very nicely into our Mm -hmm. last question which is how did the report address the issues that are currently in a lot of sports relating to the policies and practices around pregnancy and in particular maternity (laughs) policies yeah i mean i don't actually know if the report did really address this head on. I mean, it acknowledged that there's been notable recent progress 
in sports pregnancy and maternity policies. But the committee was very clear that there's more work to be done, both in terms of maternity pay and leave and the wider culture of supporting pregnant women and mothers. So in terms of its recommendation, it said that the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, UK Sport, Sport England and National Sports Governing Body should establish a permanent working group on breast practice in pregnancy and maternity policy. And that should include maternity leave and pay, wider policies about supporting pregnant sportswomen and returning mothers. So I think it's a, a watch this space in terms of what actually happens there and what, what comes out of it. And we definitely will be watching that space, that can <laughs> sure. be certain. That does bring us to the end of the questions and the interview. So I know we've only talked about a snapshot of that report, albeit we tried to cover as much as we can in seven minutes. But if anyone listening would like to read the report, you can find it online. You simply just need to Google health barriers for girls and women in sport and the UK Parliament website will come up straight away. It's 47 pages in length, but completely worth a read in its entirety. And I really do recommend that you do. And you can also find Larissa's article online. I recommend giving that a read as well. I found it on the Law and Sport website, although, again, it's been published on a number of websites. So give that a Google and you'll also find it on a platform. Larissa, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so grateful for giving up your time and for being the first one in the podcast room. (laughs) Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you also to the listeners for tuning in. Have a great week and we'll see you next Wednesday.